Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. So glad you're with us. Hope you had a great weekend. Welcome to the Monday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Got plenty to talk about today, including the fact that we're brought to you by Stamps.com. Right now, with our promo code 3 Martini, you can get a four week trial plus free postage and a digital scale. Much more about that. Stamps.com, promo code 3 Martini. Uh, Jim, let's start with our good martini. Uh, we actually have two good martinis today. Uh, we start with the protesters in Iran. The media told us last week about how angry and incensed the Iranian people were with the fact that we killed General Soleimani and uh, we've united the Iranian people against us like never before. Well, just about 48 hours later, they're united against their own regime. Back to the way they were, only this time, a little bit of the media is paying attention. I saw Nick Kristof uh, tweet on Saturday saying, This is remarkable. The Iranian people are in the streets protesting their own regime. Yeah, welcome to the last decade. Thanks for paying attention now. Uh, anyway, they're back in the streets, and this time it's, uh, I guess, the, the tipping point is the, the lying initially over the downing of the Ukrainian uh, airliner. And uh, here's a little bit of what the protest in the street sounded like. In that particular chant, it's death to Khamenei, uh, death to the mentors. Uh, Jim, I would say excellent move by the president with a series of tweets that actually got posted in Farsi. Uh, a couple of them say this, addressing Iran's leaders, don't kill your protesters. Thousands have been killed or imprisoned so far, and the world is watching. More importantly, the United States is watching. Reconnect the Internet and let reporters move freely. Stop killing the great people of Iran. Critically important tweet. Then he also addressed the people to the brave and suffering Iranian people. I have stood with you since the beginning of my presidency, and my government will continue to stand with you. We are following your protests closely. Your courage is inspiring. The Iranian government doesn't appear to be listening to that. Uh, according to the AP, police and security forces fired both live ammunition and tear gas to disperse demonstrators protesting the initial denial that the government shot down a Ukrainian jetliner. We also have the news of a high-profile defection in Iran. It's only female Olympic medalist ever. Her name, I believe, is Kimia Alizeda. She got a bronze medal in Taekwondo, uh, released a statement saying that she didn't want to sit at the table of the hypocrisy, lies, injustice, and flattery of the regime, saying they basically used her after she won the medal. Uh, she just wants a happy life, and she says she'll always be a daughter of Iran, but doesn't want to live there anymore. So, Jim, uh, the protests are actually getting some attention, and uh, I would say the president responded to them in a very effective way. Yeah, um, this is another case of so far so good, and I want to point out that when it comes to administration messaging, don't kill your protesters is a really non-controversial one. We're not hearing about anything about bombing the mullahs back to the Stone Age. We're not... Uh, this is not bellicose. This is the sort of thing that you get all of our European allies and around the world very easy to sign on to. The only countries that have a problem with don't kill your protesters would probably be, you know, China, Russia. Those guys are still very pro-killing protesters. Um, but I, I think what we are seeing here actually does count not just as, a, as our good martini, but actually think semi-extraordinary because we've seen protests against the regime in the past. The Green Revolution in 2009, which was uh, rather quickly and violently quashed. We saw similar protests in 2017. In this case, think about it. The moment we heard, we got news about the Ukrainian jetliner coming down, it did not take long for aviation experts to say, hmm, you know what? This is exactly the sort of circumstances where an air defense system might see something, might have the wrong kind of reading, and either through technological error or through human error, end up shooting down a passenger airliner. Well, a couple of days went by. The Iranians insisted they had nothing to do with it. And then it came clear, yes, actually, they did. They did. They admitted it. And they may have thought that they would be able to do kind of the ricochet argument of, well, yes, our guys shot down the plane, but ultimately it's America's fault. You know, America started this conflict with Soleimani, never mind all the Americans that Soleimani had killed over the years. They're ultimately at fault for this. And it's very interesting, you know, Greg, we've seen Americans make that argument. Uh, the argument about crossfire, you, go, you know, the plane went down in crossfire. No, no, only one side was firing that night, right? There, was, there wasn't any fire going back and forth. A couple of folks in the United States have, have decided to adopt that philosophy, but all these people in Iran are saying, no, we don't blame the United States for this. You guys shot this down and you guys lied about it for several days. And I think the most extraordinary image I've seen has been the, uh, 
the it's a university in Tehran where they have painted the American flag and the Israeli flag in the middle of the street. And the idea is that students and pedestrians step on it. That this is kind of symbolically you're stepping on the flags of these great countries. Now, it's worth noting, not everybody is avoiding stepping on these flags. But the students there understand the symbolism. The students there understand that they're being told, blame America, blame Israel. They are the enemy. And just think about it. If you're you know, a, a university student in your late teens, early 20s, or even if you're significantly older, Greg, anybody who is our age or younger in Iran only has memories of this regime. They don't remember the Shah. They don't remember anything before then. So they have been subjected to this state-run propaganda their entire lives. Everything they've ever heard from the state throughout their entire lives has been telling them it's America's fault, it's Israel's fault. The regime is trying to defend you from these bloodthirsty enemies. And here we see thousands of people in Iran saying, no, we don't believe you anymore. I'm, I'm sure that those crowds, they don't necessarily love America, right? They don't necessarily, I don't think they love Israel, but they're tired of the scapegoating. They're tired of being told that it's all the fault of these great Satan and the little Satan and all these other ones and realizing, no, you in government have made our lives worse. You in government have done things that have cost the Iranian people. We're tired of you. It is your fault. Take responsibility. And we don't know where this is going, but this is so far, and I'm, you, can, you can hear me knocking on wood there, um, going in a terrific direction. I don't know if this will lead to the toppling of the Iranian regime, but you have to figure, Greg, each time this happens, there's a cascade effect. People begin to realize, oh, wait a minute. Those people over there were able to protest the regime and not all of them got killed. Those people are willing to be that show that bravery. Maybe I should show that bravery too. Um, and hopefully this thing will spread. If nothing else, we will probably come out of this entire crisis with a significantly weakened Iranian regime. Yeah, you just have to marvel at the courage of these protesters. Uh, I mean, we talked about it in the last couple of months when the government, uh, due to the effect of the sanctions, uh, cranked up fuel prices uh, anywhere from 50 percent to 300 percent, depending on the type of fuel in the different part of the country that they were that they were looking at. And the people took to the streets. And while it's hard to get exact numbers, given the secrecy of the regime, most estimates put it somewhere around 1500 people. That's the the number Trump referenced uh, in his tweet there from from these protests. In this country, Jane Fonda is getting arrested once a week on Capitol Hill for protesting climate change. And, oh, the courage. And it's night and day, which is a testament to the greatness of our system. And it's also a testament to the courage of the people in Iran. Indeed, Greg. You know, look, you're going to hear a lot of people who are fans of the administration coming out and saying, ah, this is all to Trump's credit. Other people saying this has nothing to do with Trump. Look, we knew when we struck Soleimani, we were taking somebody who was very evil, very dangerous, who had a lot of blood on his hands. Out, you know, we're taking him off the chest. We're taking that piece off the chessboard, so to speak. We didn't know what the ramifications were going to be. We didn't know the Iranian air defense was going to shoot full, shoot down an airliner full of innocent civilians, but they did. And Iran is reacting about as badly as they possibly can. By the way, if we had managed to shoot back the moment they fired back those those rockets. The regime would be able to say, ah, here come the Americans. If we go out, if we go too far and to say, go Iranian students, go topple your regime. Well, then the regime's going to say, okay, well, here we go. It's an American plot. They're behind us. They'll probably blame the Jews, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, so far they're taking exactly the right tone. Hopefully the administration continues it. And keep an eye on the media here. We're heading into impeachment trial time here in the, on Capitol Hill. So they, they've got other big issues to look at. See how long they keep watching these protests, because the protests probably aren't going to stop anytime soon. But the coverage of the protests could stop uh, fairly soon, particularly with Internet access restricted. So you'll see how serious the media is about covering these protests compared to the protests denouncing the killing of Soleimani a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I'm guessing the coverage is going to be quite lopsided uh, in, in a way that we would not prefer. All right. Let's talk about stamps.com because, you know, we're in the New Year's. It's now January 13th. That means we're almost two weeks in. If you're still hanging on to those New Year's resolutions, good for you. You're, you're beating the odds at this point. Uh, a lot of New Year's resolutions are hard to keep, though, and mainly because they mean you have to do additional things to all the other things that you have to do. you got to join the gym if you want to do that, or you need to pay closer attention to what you're eating and calorie counting, perhaps, or whatever you want to do. Uh, but sometimes New Year's resolutions can actually make your life a whole lot simpler and easier and that's where Stamps.com comes in, because with Stamps.com, you can do anything uh, you can do at the post office right from your computer. So you don't need to waste time going to the post office. You can use Stamps.com instead. And with Stamps.com, uh, it gives you something you can't get at the post office, big discounts on your postage. You see, Stamps.com brings all the services of the U.S. Postal Service right to your computer, 
Whether you're a small business that's sending invoices or an online seller that's shipping out products, or even if you're a giant warehouse sending out thousands of packages a day, Stamps.com can handle it all with ease. You simply use your computer to print official U.S. postage 24-7 for any letter, any package, any class of mail, anywhere you want to send it. Once your mail is ready, you just hand it to your mail carrier or drop it off in a mailbox. It's just that simple. No waiting online at the Postal Service. With Stamps.com, you get five cents off every first class stamp and up to 40% off on priority mail. Not to mention, it's a fraction of the cost of those expensive postage meters. Stamps.com is a no-brainer, saving you time and money. It's no wonder that more than 700,000 small businesses already use Stamps.com. And your bills are probably coming in from Christmas and uh, other end-of-the-year spending, and you're thinking, man, I wish I could cut costs somewhere. Well, this is a great way to do it, and then you'll have that extra money for whatever disposable spending or maybe just saving that uh, you didn't have a chance to do in past years. Because if you use a lot of postage in particular, but even if you don't, Every little bit helps to add up. So give yourself a resolution you can actually keep this year. Stop going to the post office. You don't have to do it anymore. And just go to stamps.com instead. There's no risk in doing so. And with our promo code 3Martini, you get a special offer that includes a four-week trial, plus free postage, and a digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Very clean. Just go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in 3Martini. That's stamps.com, promo code 3Martini. Stamps.com. Never go to the post office again. All right, let's move on to our second good martini, Jim. And as our tradition here in the 2020 campaign, for every Democrat that drops out, it's time to celebrate the fact that that person will not be president of the United States, at least over the next four years. And today's celebrant is New Jersey Democratic Senator Cory Booker uh, didn't have a fantastic uh, fourth quarter fundraising number, wasn't going to get back on the debate stage anytime soon. His polling was languishing, to say the least. And so today he made the decision, which may have been painful, but was also obvious. Today I'm suspending my campaign for president with the same spirit with which it began. It is my faith in us, my faith in us together as a nation, that we share common pain and common problems that can only be solved with a common purpose and a sense of common cause. So he says he's going to campaign vigorously for whoever the Democratic nominee is, as well as candidates up and down the ballot. So, Jim, we talked about Booker from time to time in this campaign. You talked about how he never really had a lousy debate performance, but no matter what he did, he never moved the needle, and he's finally acknowledging reality. Yeah. Um, one of the things I think you know, that's been kind of striking about this cycle, and I think if, you know, if, if, if and when all is said and done, you want to write up what was the theme. I think the theme was that a lot of these Democratic rising stars that we've been hearing about for the past anywhere for four years to 10 years um, did not turn out to be much of anything. That once you actually put them in a situation where voter Democratic primary voters from coast to coast had them on a menu of options, that most primary voters just weren't all that interested. Julian Castro is up there, Beto, Christian Gillibrand. Um, but, you know, Cory Booker, I mean, people have been writing gushing profiles about him for a long time. And unlike Beto and unlike Julian and some of these other folks, I think you could make an argument that Cory Booker more or less earned them. Or at least, you know, as I write in a corner post that just went up a little while ago, you know, you look at Cory Booker's life. He, he probably had a better case of making. He was that dos echos, the most interesting guy in the world. Um, you know, the multiracial vegan, he was a standout Stanford tight end. You can find, go, on, go on YouTube and find videos of him making catches in big games, right? Uh, took on Sharp James as mayor of Newark, did not succeed the first time around, but they made a documentary about it. I would say the circa late 90s, early 2000s, Cory Booker was a figure that a lot of Republicans would find quite appealing. Uh, he was a very outspoken advocate for school choice and for vouchers. Uh, he was a vehement critic of machine politics in big cities. Um, reached out to Wall Street and Silicon Valley. There was a time where you probably say based on this that he was running this kind of centrist reformer with results kind of attitude. And the problem for him, for Cory Booker, is that in 2016, Donald Trump won the presidential election and the mood of the Democratic Party changed dramatically. And Mr. Sunny Optimism was just not what they wanted. And so as you go down over this stuff, but everything he had in his career, um, I mean, he's dating actress Rosario Dawson, um, this was this was on paper. He should have been the celebrity candidate. He should have been able to more or less replicate what Barack Obama did in 2008. And he couldn't at all. Uh, I went back and people said, oh, you know, he, for a while he was competitive in South Carolina. 
Greg, what was the highest percentage Cory Booker got in any poll in South Carolina in the past year? I'm guessing it's single digits. 6%. First of all, when 6% means it's gaining momentum, that shows you just how low the bar <laughs> was for that. And, and that, like I said, this was his best state. You weren't really seeing, you know, great numbers in Iowa. So on the one hand, today's news is kind of anticlimactic because people have known Cory Booker was not going to be the nominee for a while. On the other hand, the, the degree of how much he, he failed, and as you said, didn't really have any terrible gaffes on the campaign trail. Um, you could argue he just really never got noticed. And there are a bunch of reasons people will be speculating about that for a while. I think the, the, one of the causes that I put my finger on in that corner post, and I think it's probably worth remembering, is what, what was his one go-to move in every debate, Greg? Hey, why do we have to keep arguing about this? Can't we come together? We need to defeat Donald Trump. Right, exactly. This kind of infighting is just what the Republicans want to see. <laughs> Well, maybe, but it's also this kind of infighting is also how parties sort out differences that they disagree about, right? You know, the purpose of, I, as I wrote in today's Morning Jolt, the, the presidential candidates, presidential nominees, Greg, they're kind of like Highlander. <laughs> there can be only one. <laughs> now, thankfully, they don't have to behead each other in a battle to be the last immortal. Uh, you're, you're welcome for that 80s film reference. <laughs> but nonetheless, there's this sense that this is... Um, Con- present presidential primaries are about contrast. You have to say, I believe I am the best candidate and here's why. And inherent in that is I am a better candidate than all these other folks on this stage. And Cory Booker's, eh, let's not fight amongst ourselves. Um, I wonder if some people interpreted that as a bit of reticence about getting into the mud, a bit of, a bit of reticence about going on the attack. And that was not the kind of trait you wanted to advertise. If you were going to say, hey, Democrats, trust me, I can beat Donald Trump. Jim, uh, quick question for you. I, I, if I were Andrew Yang or Michael Bennett, who, yes, is still running, uh, maybe even Amy Klobuchar, somebody who probably didn't have a whole lot to lose. But now that Cory Booker has said he's out, wouldn't it be hilarious if one of them stood up and said, I am Cory Booker? And then the next one no. stood up and said, I am Cory Booker. <laughs> right. Yeah, the, the, the Spartacus moment. He always came across as a candidate who was trying a little too hard, you know, who, who was... Um, his, his, you know, he had good lines in the debates, but they always seemed very well rehearsed. And, you know, it just, it just was constantly, it, it, it was almost unnatural. It was, it was, it was, it was artificial, I guess, not unnatural. Um, that, that there was always this sense that he was trying really, really hard to be the, the perfect democratic candidate. And, uh, you know, in the end, it was just not what democratic primary voters were looking for this cycle. Yeah. I'm not going to forget his, uh, performance at the Kavanaugh hearings anytime soon, where he tried to pretend like he was breaking all the rules. And these are documents that haven't been cleared and declassified. And Chuck Grassley, the chairman at the time, is saying, no, they have. They have. No, no, I'm breaking the rules here. You got to realize what I'm doing. I demand that you sanction me. (laughs) Oh, man, what a mess that was. But uh, anyway, let's talk about uh, Cory Booker, you know, tried to be a woke candidate a lot of times as well. And uh, most of these Democrats certainly have or they're trying to figure it out, Joe Biden among them. But uh, political correctness, as you know, is, is getting us nowhere. In fact, it's uh, uh, creating a lot of problems in a lot of different ways. And in addition to this podcast, another podcast you might want to check out uh, that deals a lot with political correctness and its corrosive effect on our culture is the Mock and Daisy Common Sense Cast. Uh, it's two really funny, intelligent women, Mock and Daisy, also known as uh, Chicks on the Right. They talk about the issues that matter to you. It's the Mock and Daisy Common Sense Cast. They talk about parenting, social media, political correctness, the importance of marriage, men, and family values in an increasingly crazy world, thanks in part to the PC culture. A little bit of a dash of politics, uh, go off on a lot of an interesting and and funny tangents. Um, they just uh, think America is going to be better if we focus more on our own homes. Find out more about the Mock and Daisy Common Sense Cast by going to chicksontheright.com or start listening on the Apple Podcast app, Spotify, or your favorite podcasting platform. I'm sure they'd have plenty to say also about this next one, but we're going to get to say it first, and that's Nancy Pelosi, the House Speaker. Jim, boy, did she ever play Mitch McConnell. Boy, did he ever give in to her demands for uh, setting the rules for this impeachment trial. No, no, he did not give in. But she's now sending them over anyway because this uh, tactic has largely backfired. Uh, It's going to happen this week. The trial could start this week. And so Nancy Pelosi goes on this week with George Stephanopoulos. Not exactly the person who you expect to trip up most Democrats. But George actually asked a couple of challenging questions, uh, one of which was, hey, you know, you subpoenaed all these Trump administration officials. They decided to challenge those subpoenas in court And instead of actually going through the legal process, you decided to impeach anyway. And now you're complaining about witnesses. So 
why not just finish the legal fight before you impeach? And uh, here's Nancy Pelosi. Why not wait for the courts to rule? Well, because it'll be how, how, how long do the courts take? We had we have confidence in our case that it is impeachable. And this president is impeached for life, regardless of any gamesmanship on the part of uh, Mitch McConnell. However, uh, that could still come to bear. But we're confident in the impeachment and we think that it is enough testimony to remove him from office. So, Jim, uh, you can tell she's essentially saying, have you seen it's an election year, George? we got to move on this thing. And then the tone in her voice of impeached for life, no matter what Mitch McConnell does. So uh, I think we know what's going on here. We need to work quickly on this, George. That's why I've taken three weeks of delays. <laughs> I also love this. You know, he's impeached for life. Was anybody arguing this was some sort of temporary double secret probation type deal? You know, well, he's impeached within 10 years. It comes off his record. Bill Clinton was impeached for life, too. <laughs> you know, like, you know, impeached for life, you know. And but like the great irony is, you know, that's the kind of phrasing that she clearly thought through. OK, how can I annoy President Trump the most? What's going to annoy? What's going to irk him? What's going to really get him raring anger? And she's probably right. Right. You know, oh. I didn't, I didn't realize this was going to be it for life. You know, they're, they're going to be writing about this with my obituary. Yeah. Again, I, this, this is, you know, face saving on their part. I'm still in here. Democrats, I guess the whole idea is this sense of, um, you know, they're telling us, oh, we, we put more attention on the issue. And, and uh, I, I don't, I'm not seeing it. Not convinced. Sorry, pal. That's where we are. I, I suppose we'll see a lot of this. By the way, I just want to observe, Greg, we have this continuing situation in Iran. It's not like the situation in Hong Kong calmed down that much. Um, the Oscars came out earlier today. You've got the, the Democratic primary going, are people going to pay that much attention to impeachment? I have a feeling this is going to be a bottom of page A1, page A2, page A3 story for the next couple of weeks, just because everybody knows how it ends and everybody's heard the arguments and it's been stuck in neutral for, you know, three weeks for no discernible reason. But now Cory Booker can focus full time on being a juror. <laughs> Clears up the schedule. <laughs> it does. It does. All right, Jim, happy Monday to you. See you tomorrow. And in the meantime, folks, uh, head to stamps.com. Use the promo code 3Martini. Four-week trial, free postage, digital scale. What's not to love? Go to stamps.com, promo code 3Martini. And we'll see you on Tuesday on the 3Martini Lunch.